I began lecturing. You know, Richard Buck was a classmate of Garford and Clifford Broussard. These, these were two twins. Uh, they, they weren't uh, identical. They were fraternal. But uh, they were orthodox. And Garford was an inventive genius. I've never seen anybody like him. He had a great pair of hands. But he could, he could almost, he, he could hardly write his name. He was just an inventive genius. And so they recruited me to, to write an article. So, you know, I, uh, we, we went up on Lake Austin, I think Labor Day. Werner Pfluger, he was an orthodontist, a friend of ours, and he had a little house up there. So we went up like for a day-long picnic or something like that, you know. And so Garford begins lecturing to me about this bracket he's got and this technique he's got. I don't know what he's talking about. I mean, it's like he, he came from Mars and I'm writing this stuff down and, you know, I'm trying to make sense out of it. And when he finishes, I, got, I have about two or three pages of chicken scratching and I, I can't make heads or tails out of it. So I sit down and I begin trying to arrange this thing in some kind of an order, you know, semblance of, to make some sense out of it. And, you know, then we, we, we put together, we, we got uh, a few drawings from Rocky Mountain Orthodontics, and then Garford gave me some of his clinical photos of patients, and we put this thing together, and we mail it off to the American Journal, and they publish it. You know, it was a big deal. And, and after that, we began getting invitations from all over the United States to come and lecture. And we literally did. We went all over the United States. I mean, when I say that, you know, we went to California, uh, we went to Chicago, we went to Philadelphia, we went to New York, we went to Memphis. Well, you know, quite a few mm -hmm. places like that. Las Vegas. Well, in uh, 1973, I think it was 1973, there were 40 Japanese and Korean dentists that came to Houston. And we put on a three-day program for them. And I don't know, I mean, they had read our article and they were fascinated. I didn't know who they were. Half of them couldn't speak English, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, I began using Garford's method, and so we had a lot of clinical cases treated from beginning to end. You know, we probably, you know, among the four of us, we probably had 100 cases, maybe more, you know. So we'd pick the best ones to show different kinds of problems and how to treat them. And I mean, these, these people were really impressed with it. So we put on this program, and then meantime, we were still lecturing, you know. We, we went to uh, the Mexican Association of Orthodontists had, a, had us at Cozumel, when they had first made a resort out of that. Mm -hmm. So we went to there, to Mexico. We went to Italy for a five-day course. We went to Paris for a five-day course. We went to Boston. We, we, we went around a little bit. And, uh, and then in 1977, the Japanese invited us to Tokyo and then to Fukuoka, which is southern Japan. So we were in, we put on a course in Tokyo, I think at the Imperial Hotel, and then we went to southern Japan and uh, we put on this course, and there, there were, I don't know, 50 or 60 there, maybe more. And then we, we developed a group there that we were going every year. Hmm. I mean, every year, every other year, we went to Japan at least five times lecturing to this group. And then we went to, uh, we went to Taipei once, went to Hong Kong once, and Hong Kong, we. We, Garford and I went to Macau, that Portuguese colony, you know, the gambling colony. We went there and we lectured to about 50 dentists from China. Hmm. 
we, we put on the, like a three-day course. That was really nice. I mean, it, Macau's a filthy city, but we were in a really nice French, like a French hotel. And these, these Chinese dentists were really hospitable and nice. I mean, uh, uh, that, that was a very enjoyable time. Well, anyway, then we began lecturing in, in Thailand, and we went to Bangkok six times. Wow. You know, so we were sort of really going around and around. Meantime, I'm neglecting my practice, but, you know, uh, we, we made a lot of trips overseas. So were these trips very profitable for you? No, it was a break-even, sort of. They'd cover our expenses. We thought it was a big deal, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a big honor. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go there and you, I mean, you know, you're there in a bank when there's 200 people there paying tribute to you. I mean, right. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. So was this all part of that book? I've got a book. Yeah, right that's, that that's was, the same thing. Yeah, it, you know, we wrote that book finally. Because what happened was Gregory died sort of in 19... When Gregory died? 73, know, started 73, 73, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and that sort of threw me off on that book. Uh, I think I have the dates right when we went to uh, Japan, though. A any, anyway, we, we sort of did our technique, and you know, in orthodontics, you have a lot of very bright people developing new techniques, so, you know, the, the, these techniques are good for about 10 years, 12 years, and then they sort of run their course, and you know, people are tired of hearing you, they want to hear somebody new, so we sort of fell out of favor. And then by this time I had a lot of other interests and things and I was, I was getting tired of doing it. So we stopped about, uh, and, and then I, you know, in between I went and got an MBA, which, you know, was a couple of years of really intensive work. So, you know, we sort of, I, I backed out. Garford and, and wanted me to stay in. He kept pushing me. Dr. Buck dropped out very early in this. And so the three of us were going, Garford and Clifford and I. And uh, Clifford's wife had kidney failure. She was on dialysis. Mm -hmm. And you talk about a risk. She flew to Japan and had to be dialyzed within a couple hours after she landed there. And she had to trust that they would have it ready for her, and they did. But, I mean, you, you can imagine that's a risk you take, you know. Sure. Because, you, you know, she has to be dialyzed at least three times a week. And, you know, you skip for a day or two, I mean, you've got to do it. Right. So, I mean, that, that affected it, too, and, and uh, she died, and, you know, anyway, I, we, we stopped, you know, we, we had a good run for about 10 or 15 years. We wrote a couple articles. Then I began writing financial articles. Really? I wrote a few. Then I, I didn't wrote know a about this. Well, there's a lot of things you don't know. I wrote a couple of financial articles. I wrote one on life insurance, and, and uh, I sort of got away from the technical aspect and a little bit more from the business aspect. So what got you into the financial articles? Well, I mean, people were asking me. I, I, I did a couple lectures on finance where I went to, uh, uh, I flew to Roanoke, Virginia to uh, that big resort there that Rockefeller did uh, up there, you know. Uh, where, where did Elizabeth go to school? You know, up there in Virginia? A anyway, I, I put on, <coughs> I, I had, a, you know, two or three hours of stuff I was showing on finance, trying to help people. And a lot of people came to me and wanted me to do this. You know, because when I wrote an article in I DDS MBA, you know, there were hardly any orthodontists in the country who were MBAs. Right. There, there was a lot of them now, but at that time there weren't. So anyway, the day that I went up there, after like a one-hour break, <clears throat> somebody came to me and said, the market's down 150 points. I thought, wow. And then, uh, you know, at another break, they said, the market's down 250. I thought, what's going on? And it was 1987 when the market went down 500 and some points that day. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, <clears throat> I finished the lecture. And uh, they drove me to the airport, and I, I got the, the flight home. Claire met me at the airport, and I said, what's going on? She said, 
I think the stock market went down 500 points. I thought, oh, hell, you, you know, she, she never gets it right, you know. So I came home, and Jessica said, Daddy, the stock market went down 550 points, and I taped it for you. The nightly business report. I went, what? <laughs> I'm up there talking finance. I'm wiped out. You know? <laughs> so I watched this thing, and I mean, you talk about stuff melting you know, like melt, uh, snow melting in the sun. Right. I mean, everything was just collapsed that day. I mean, it looked like Armageddon. Uh, you know, people were predicting this is another, res it's not a recession, it's a depression. You know, they, they had been expecting a depression once World War II was over. And, you know, this was 30 years later, and, you know, we still, 40 years later, we still didn't have this depression. Right. So it didn't look like th this was the beginning of it. So I had to apologize to Claire because she had it right, you know. I didn't, I didn't hardly believe her. So what do you think uh, kept everything out of a depression in 87? I think uh, Greenspan had just gone in, or he, he was in there, and he just provided a lot of liquidity to the banks. And, uh, you know, the banks extended the loans and they didn't call, they didn't... Uh, they weren't calling loans like they were in the early 80s when the real estate collapsed. You know, that was really sort of stupid that they, they let that happen. Mm -hmm. That should have never happened. And, and uh, you know, they, they just closed down a lot of banks where, which were marginally sound. And with just a little bit of an infusion of cash, they, you know, they could have weathered the storm and it wouldn't have dis destroyed the real estate market. Because the the FDIC and the FSLIC had to pick up all that, you know, all those banks that failed, you know, those loans were guaranteed by the FDIC, FSLIC. So they ended up with this huge inventory of distressed loans and real estate, and I, you know, I bought some, and people that had a little bit of money were buying at that time. Stuff was selling literally for. 10, 20 cents on a dollar, but we didn't know it. I mean, you couldn't be sure that it wasn't going to go down more. Right. You know, you, you don't know these things. You, you gamble when you buy them. But uh, they provided enough liquidity in 87 that, the, you know, the market stabilized for a while. And then, you know, people came to the conclusion the world wasn't going to end. The United States wasn't going to fall off the end of the ocean or something. Right. But it, it, was, it was a little touch and go for a while. You know, it's difficult to, to lecture finance <clears throat> to a diverse audience because you, got, you have some people in there that know more than you do. You have some people that don't know a stock from a bond. You have people in there that are multimillionaires. You have people in there that are indebted up to their eyeballs. And, you know, they think that you have one solution that's going to cover that, you know, the whole audience. It's impossible. Right. You know, no matter, you know, what would be appropriate for one person wouldn't be appropriate for the next. Right. But you know, you give them general guidelines, and I didn't have anything that uh, 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 you know noteworthy. It was just sort of basic principles. So what what were your basic principles? Well, you know, I was I was trying to tell them to buy, <clears throat> uh, you know, permanent life insurance, cash value, not to all buy term, mm -hmm. because uh, you know if. The people, at that time, the inheritance taxes were high, you know, and, and if you developed a, a big practice and if you ended up with a fairly large estate, you know, how are you going to satisfy your uh, inheritance taxes if you didn't have life insurance and you had to have a lot of it? You know, people still don't understand life insurance, that, that's another topic. But anyway, I was trying to show them how to buy life insurance when they were young. I had, I had, some, I had a life insurance table, you know, from birth to like 70. Right. And I was showing the premiums on like a $100,000 policy and a million dollar policy. And, you know, I was, showing, I was showing them at various places. If you buy the large policies when you're young, the discount is greater. Mm -hmm. If you buy the large policy when you're much older, there's hardly any discount between the hundred thousand and the million. At early ages, at least at that time, 
th there was a big difference, a significant difference. And, you know, so many orthodontists are poor investors, so they, they, they'd lose their money anyway, buying real estate, you know, getting into crazy investments, you know, foreign currencies, oil, mm -hmm. you know, real estate. And, and you know, the, there were people, when the real estate market broke in Austin, there were more than 50 doctors that MK knew. So there wasn't all of them. There were more than 50 that MK knew that were on the verge of bankruptcy. They, they, they got wiped out. They had big real estate investments because the accountants were recommending to uh, large income people, you know, you have, to, uh, you have to take on some debt to get some uh, uh, interest that you can deduct. You don't have enough deductions, so you, you got all income. Now you need some real estate deductions. So people were buying large blocks of real estate, big investments, and then as soon as the market turned down, you know, the equity began to, to, to melt away. Mm -hmm. And so in order to hold the loan, you had to put up more equity, and they couldn't do it. Right. So then there was foreclosure, then they got wiped out completely. I mean, and you had people that literally had worked, practiced medicine 30 and 35 years and were bankrupt. Now, if they had put some of that money in cash value life insurance, they'd, they'd at least have that. That wouldn't right. have gone away. Right. So, I mean, there's a, there's a place for some of these investments depending upon your personal situation, you know, how much you owe, how much you own, and, you know, how many children, you know. But, you know, most doctors don't understand it. They're, you know, they're sold term because it's so cheap. Right. So they buy the term, you know, and then they have to renew it, and the premiums start going up, up. And then when they really need it, let's say that they don't lose their money. Let's say that they create a $5 million estate, and they're 65 or 70 years old. Then they suddenly have a need for a lot of life insurance, and they may not be able to pass a physical. Mm -hmm. Or they get rated up. Now, life insurance is something that very few people, the people who understand life insurance are the people who sell it. But they don't always have your interest at heart. Right. You know, you have to know how to buy it. But I mean, hardly anybody studies life insurance. You've got to be sort of nutsy to sit there and study it. But there's a big reward for it. Hmm. Life insurance is a tremendous topic. All right, so we, there's a minute and a half left on this tape. Minute and a half left. What kind of a lie can I tell? <laughs> so, uh, so, on the topic of finance, in 60 seconds or less, um, best thing to do when you have a mortgage is to get it paid off as soon as possible. I, absolutely. And no matter what anyone says, your interest deductions are not that great and they're not that advantageous. But when you can pay off your house, you have something that you own. And, and as long as you have a mortgage on that house, you don't own it. And my esteemed friend Robert Sneed, the attorney, said, do you understand what a mortgage is? And I said, no. He said, what a mortgage is, is this. As long as you pay, they ain't got no rights. And if you can't pay, you ain't got no rights. And he said, you understand that? I said, yes. And that's, that's it in a nutshell. And, you know, it's, it's terrible to see people losing their homes and having to move from a, a big, elegant home to some little, you know, three, two cracker box somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't imagine how many physicians and dentists got, got wiped out. You know, R R Reuben Johnson had a big group with the United Bank, uh, uh, and, and the investment, the basic investment was like 100000 for the block, you know, and people took two and three of those, which might not seem like a whole lot now, but in 1980, in 1979, that was a fair amount of money to put up that much after-tax dollars, sure. or to go to a bank and borrow a hundred or 200000 cash and put it up and then lose it, right. because he lost both buildings. The United Bank building and the building across the street, which was taken over by the state of Texas. Mm. So a lot of doctors 
had investments in there and got wiped out. 